Hmm, bada bada boom boom boom. I hope this setup is working. This is always the issue, right? Is the tech working? Is the tech working? How do we know? We don't know if the tech is working ever. All right, I'm gonna get my shit together. So, occasionally I jump on here and do a live that's kind of like a recorded podcast. Um, it's cringy. I think that the the way that we're doing things now in social media and Western cultures is very cringy. But there's always something to clean up. And so as our society falls apart, because it's natural that um, if you build a house on sand or lies, it's going to fall down eventually. Um, so we're, we're, we're watching the sort of widespread fragmentation of the Western model of economics, culture, societal hierarchies. We're watching it all fall apart. Um, we're watching the sort of inevitable cascade of imperialism and what that is and how that works and what that does and the propaganda. We're sort of watching it and we're watching it hit these different people at different speeds. If you are a black person or a diasporic person or indigenous person, you already know this shit. But it's for everyone else who thought that they could get away with it, that they that they were somehow sheltered from this kind of reality. Um, you're watching it hit people and they're watching them go crazy because um, when things change, they destabilize. And when your stability, this is the house of cards, if you think you're stable, but your stability, your house of cards, your worldview, your economic structures, your family structures, the way that you relate philosophically with the universe, with your body, if that's all lies, or predominantly lies, when something like this happens, and you know what I'm talking about, all the wars, all the imperial, the imperial genocides, you know that uh, you destabilize, you fall down, and things fall apart, and that's natural. And so most people, they don't have a correct view of what's happening so they go crazy and they try to rationalize it and what I'd like to come on here today on this particular day um, as a disabled person who's dealing with ancestral drama um, I think I, I try to be a voice of sanity in a very insane competitive field. Um, we have a lot of tribalism. We have a lot of identitarianism. We have a lot of inability to understand that the world is a non-dual dream. And that non-duality means that you got to clean up your own shit. And no one wants to hear that. Uh, people want mommy and daddy to do it for them. And you believe that your beliefs are correct. And this is the long road to maturity, is that you realize such a stupid little shit you are and how so many of your ideas and impulses are based in a kind of threat response to this capitalistic patriarchal nonsense. Now, I want to clear it up really fast, as simply as I can today. The Western psychotic break, which is the Cartesian split, which is I'm separate from my mind, my body's separate from my mind, I'm separate from the land, we're separate from each other. 
this idea that you could be an individual. That is in itself a defense against pain, fear, and hunger. And it's a way to siphon resources and con concentrate and hoard resources. Those resources are material, but they're not just material. It's also energetic, emotional, anything that you would consider a resource. Empathy, cognition, those are all resources, right? So the, the worldview of this reductionist, separatist, segregated, put it all into boxes, hierarchy thing, um, it is a response to an inability to relate with the primal forces of pain, fear, and hunger as wisdom itself. I don't think I can say it any clearer than that, but I have to unpack it. Okay? And to unpack it, I first need to take you way back, 300,000 years ago. I have to do it. Even though it's a bit like walking through a thousand dreams, right? It's a bit like a little bit magical thinking, a little bit fantasy, a lot of feeling, a lot of thinking. And thinking and feeling are linked. They're not opposed to each other. And asking for help to do that. Asking for help from the elemental forces, from the seven directions, from the land, from the sky, from the mothers and the fathers, who are not just human. There is a kernel of truth in everything wrong. There's a reason why it went that way. And we have to really sit with that because in the same exact situation we might have done the same exact thing and we might do the same exact thing in the same exact situation or similar situation which is to say if we feel persecuted we might persecute others in the particular kind of situation we have the capacity within us for all the things that have ever happened and ever will happen. All the actions that a universe can take or, or can make, which is all the things you don't want to talk about. All the taboo words, all the nasty words, all the wrong and bad things. We each have within us those seeds. And we might pass them down to other people or we might outsource them onto other people as we're alive. Right? They're the same thing. Having a kid and passing down your genetic bullshit is not so different than hurting another person and implanting within them your bullshit. Because we're all related. And if I hurt you, or you hurt me, oh, we're really related now. We're tied up. Eons of karma are tied up now. So you have to realize... There's no escape from this shit. There's just dealing with it directly. There's just being the kind of storyteller that you wish you had when you were a kid. Who actually had wisdom and grace and cleverness and wit. But a lot of grit. Because to do this thing that I'm talking about, you have to do it into dying. You have to do it into death, even if nobody cares. And it doesn't make you a martyr, because that's bullshit too. You just have to do it because it's the right thing to do. And it has integrity, and it has a kind of simplicity and a relativism. And you look at the world in a different way. You, you interact with reality in a different way once you get over the hump. And a lot of people right now, we see them... They're not over the hump. They're not over the hump. Uh, it's a. Uh, they're getting stuck inside the hump. They're building a house there. They're digging a ditch. They're digging a pit. And they're camping out at the hump. And we need to get people over the hump. Because over the hump is collectivism. Over the hump is anti fascism. Because actually nobody wants to live in fascism. Even the fascists don't want fascism. They just don't think 
they have another choice. Because remember, it's a response to a feeling of intolerability, pain, fear, and hunger. Intolerable. I'll move this up for a second. So let's talk about what happened at the beginning. So at the beginning, we were pretty much any other primate and we started to evolve or change in slightly different ways because that's what the universe does. But before we had language which allows us to create these concepts and these subdivisions and these distinctions, we have to go back to before what that was in order to work with what is happening now. And before we had language, we had singing and dancing. Okay. We had singing and dancing. I'm going to put some stuff on mute. We had singing and dancing before language. So how we developed language was through this kind of musical way of living. The sounds in the jungle, the sounds we made. And those could be vocal sounds, could be physical sounds. And from that singing and dancing develops everything we know. Right? Everything we think we know about ourselves is developed from singing and dancing that's pre-linguistic, which is just like what babies do. This kind of babbling brook. And then how mothers sing song. It's called prosody now, but it's this kind of sing song. There's a new study out that says that children learn language better if it's sung sing song to them, which is say not phonics, not phonetically, but just like da 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 da, and like telling them stories and talking to them via this kind of sing songy way. And when we say sing song, it means that there's not just a singing; it's a talk singing. There's a talk singing that's happening, and there's like, oh my goodness. And we do it when we talk to kids naturally, if you're attuned to your body, because kids are naturally in this kind of jelly dance like state. They're kind of, hey, da da da, hey da 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 da, da 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 da. They have a syncopation, a rhythm, an asymmetrical timing, which lends itself well to music. These little riffs that are happening in the body, these little jazz riffs, da 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 da. Da 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 ba ba ba, and it doesn't have to sort of make sense or be like a coherent composition. But the point is, is that that's our baseline state. Is this kind of musical play, this call and response with the universe, and when mothers and all the other caretakers do that with the children, the grandfathers, the grandmothers, the aunts, the uncles, the older brothers and sisters, the older kids in the village we get this kind of really fast learning because that mirrors what the jungle is doing. This kind of like the birds over here and the tigers over there and the rivers over there and those plants are over there and it's like do 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 it's like a symphony. Right? It's like a symphony and how you focus your attention and interact with that symphony changes your relationship with it. And it's not about ideas or ideologies at this point. It's just about the physical reality of this kind of paying attention, but then making these, having these reactions and then like being affected and affecting others. This is also the basis of the, the basics of acting in theater. You affect me, I affect you. You affect me, I affect you. You affect me, that's drama. And we can heighten that drama to make stories. And those stories can teach us and put us into a dreamlike state where we can get information from the universe that is not human. So that we can actually understand things that we don't have the uh, initial understanding that we don't even understand. It's like we don't know what we don't know. But we put ourselves into this kind of dreamlike state and a trance-like state occurs and then we can get non-dual information, which is to say we can become visited by spirits, ancestors, future beings. Um, time is wobbly. Time is not linear in this state. The story that is being told now is also being told then. 
And this is why ritual is so important. Ritual, ceremony, theater, singing, dancing. They're all the same. They're interlocking. And if we do this correctly, we can, we can clean out the junk. And the junk has to be cleaned out routinely. And I know that I'm speaking to a white majority, and this is the problem. Y'all don't clean your junk out routinely. Y'all don't know how. Y'all have ideas about what it's like to be pure. This isn't about purity. When you turn on your favorite song on the radio, it's not about purity. You want to hear that song played. All the, and even when you hear it live, it's all the mistakes. That's because it's happening now. This idea that there can be a purity is part of the issue. What you need is a relational dynamism that keeps everything checks and balances. The wolves in the forest keep certain populations down so that they don't overgrow, so that other, right? It's like this cycle of predation and nourishment. And it's everything in its right place. It's everything in right relationship. But if you kill all the hyper predators except for us, and then we have now 8 billion of us on the planet hyper predating beyond what we should, we get what we have now. We get diseases that we don't have control for. We get a kind of mind virus, a cannibalism mind virus. Because what we're doing will never be enough for what we need. We're so hungry that we're starving. And we're so fat that we're starving. And we're so crazy that we're starving. And we're so starving that we're crazy. And on and on and on and on. Because we're not living in the correct balance. We're not living in the correct relationality. And for a lot of people, getting off the teat of consumerism is going to feel like detoxing from heroin. De becoming uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. You're not going to like it, and you're going to run back. And the reason you're going to run back is because the entire society tells you, it's okay to run back, child. Here's a new bottle for you to suck on. And you don't want to get clean. You don't want to get sober. This country, this culture, it's not about sobriety. It's here to party and fuck until it dies in a heap of festering disease. That's what this culture is for on some level. It is the inevitable march of progress, which is the imperial edict to consume until one bursts. It is a sort of death march towards a kind of suicide by consumption. And so if you don't understand that, you're going to try to fix it in all the wrong ways because what we have to look at from a storytelling point of view is that we have a bunch of people who have been addicted to heroin since birth because they were addicted in the womb. Their parents were addicted, so it passed on to their kids. And now you have a predilection in your system for the junk. And this is very, very hard to deal with because you don't even remember the first time you got high. You don't remember the first time you got fucked up on this junk because it's been there since before you were born. So when we see all these people freaking the fuck out and trying to kill other people because they're freaking the fuck out and they can't deal with their own goddamn fucking feelings, Cop City in Atlanta can't deal with their fucking feelings. Right? Middle East can't deal with their fucking feelings. American psychosis murdering other countries for hundreds of years can't deal with their own feelings. European imperialism can't deal with their own feelings. Patriarchy can't deal with their own feelings. And this is not to say that a bunch of hyper-empathic 
so-called white feminists can deal with their feelings either. Because 90% of white psychology and somatics is also can't deal with my feelings. Just pretend that I can deal with my feelings because I have a lot of systems that tell me, fictions that tell me that I can deal with my feelings through this somatic trembling or something. Or whatever fucking technique you think you have mastered, which has been stolen from indigenous people, reworked and co-opted and corrupted to talk to white people in their consumeristic mindset their dualistic mindset. So when you look at all this shit that's going on, when you look at all this shit, all this like, I have the answer to your money problems. I have the answer to your pain problems. I have the answer to your desire problems. I have the answer to your fear problems. Right? You just see how deep it actually goes. The maturity process is really one of disillusionment because all the hope you had when you were younger will eventually get ground like in a grindstone. God or whatever you want to call it will put your nose there until it's rubbed clean because your, your immature ideas about solving the problems are creating more problems. And if you really want wisdom, you will not be popular you will go through a long period of feeling like you lose things that you shouldn't lose, that you deserve to have, that you're owed. These are all parts of the addiction detox process. So when we jump to the next fancy toy, the next therapeutic milestone that will somehow change all of human consciousness, if only we just all did ayahuasca together, you have to realize that's being filtered through the very same addiction that will never be solved. The master's tools cannot destroy the master's house, buddies. You have to understand this. So if you are approaching all of these methods with the wrong view, you are in for eons, decades, lifetimes of sabotage. And you'll think that you're healing, but it's sabotage. You're sabotaging yourself, your kids, you're sabotaging your neighbors, you're sabotaging ancestors. Because it's the same cycle, just kind of put in a new costume. So you have to understand what's the basics of what we're talking about here. What's How do we get out of this? Well, one is there's no out. There's only in, there's only through, there's only with. And the ability to hold your integrity while you deal with that. And that's going to look different for lots of people. But if you go back to the beginning, remember what it's all about. How did we get here? We needed to help each other. We needed cooperation. And in order to have cooperation, we need to suppress domination. So the mothers figured out how to suppress domination via singing, dancing, and menstrual rituals. And this has all been studied, so I'm not going to like list it all, but I've, you know, all the fucking literatures out there, they, they interview all the people in fucking Bantu Republic and shit. Like, this is all real. It's all still happening. This is the original indigenous wisdom. How do we live with the land and with each other without constantly killing and raping each other? How do we deal with the fact that children are born with mysterious gifts and powers that sometimes make them go crazy? How do we deal with that? How do we deal with the fact that there's something that happens called birth and there's something that happens called death? And if you're born, you die. It's period. What the fuck is that? And how do we deal with it? Well, what our ancient ancestors figured out is that through singing and dancing and more complex rituals and symbols, we could communicate. And we could communicate with each other, which means language, sign language, other kinds of language, spirit language. But we could also communicate with the more than human world. We can communicate with the ancestors and the descendants, which is to say time. We could communicate through time. 
And then we need checks and balances to make sure that our communications and our interpretations of that communication are not stupid. We don't have this, we don't have these structures in America. You have to piece them together yourself or you have to be initiated into a lineage that has these structures. And both ways are fraught. I'm not saying one way is better than the other. I'm saying both ways are fraught with charlatans, con artists, and your own addiction, your own addiction patterns. Because it's it's so when you're in pain, the amount of pain that we're actually in, if we stopped blocking it and we stopped putting stories on it. I'm talking about take the fucking band-aid off and look at the wound. And do not Put another fucking band-aid story on that wound as long as you're able. And most of you will freak out and want to die. And some of you will tell me, I'm already doing that. And that's your fucking band-aid. The idea that you're already doing the best right thing. No, no, no. You have to take off the fucking band-aid from the wound. And you have to just fucking sit there and stop putting more narratives on top of it. Stop explaining about it. Stop making solutions for it. And you have to feel it in such a way that you do not collapse into your dualistic insanity program. There's not many people that can do this in this culture. Even me, I have a very hard time doing it because we all have our own issues, our own addictions, our own little fucking twists and turns. But this is as close as I can get to how simple it actually is. If you do this, the process itself will carry you along and you will just have to reflect on a regular basis. How am I reacting to this process? Am I reacting in a way that's sober? Or am I reacting in a way that's addicted? Most of the time you'll be like, I could be a little more sober. Now, for a lot of people, this thing, you're not going to do it. You're just not going to do it. So what's second best? Second best is make art about it. Singing and dancing about it. The minute we have an about, you're already one level into abstraction and addiction and delusion. So you have to understand that too. You could make art about it your whole life and never really deal with it. But I'm telling it to you because most of you will not do the thing I just talked about. It's too difficult for you. You have too many excuses why you can't do it. And you have too many fears about what will happen if you continue to do it. And those, some of those fears are justified and some of those fears are hallucinations. So the second best pattern is to make art about it. And, to, and with it, like to make art as a process of coping and relating with the phenomenon itself, pain, fear, and hunger, and all of the various reactions you have about those forces. I think one of the hardest things about this is that um, you'll encounter a lot of different kinds of pain and fear and hunger if you do this. And some of those pains and fears and hungers you will decide are good for you to kind of indulge. We could call those preferences. And it's very tricky here because 
there's no real way to tell if the preferences you have are wisdom nature tricking you into healing in a very roundabout way or if they're just your resistance to it. That's why it's so complicated because anything at this point in the story could be weaponized by your mind and your ego and your soul, whatever you want to call it, in order to just kind of get some relief or what you believe is relief. Because you haven't figured out that there's relief in just being with the phenomenon without any narrative. And yet, there will always be a part, at least in my case, at least in the case of people living without a lineage, without structure, without support, very tenuous, very on the edge of homelessness. There's just always going to be a way to opt out. You know, like we're not just like stranded in a desert where we actually just have to deal with it. Like if we were just stranded in a desert, we had no food, wandering around, and we knew we were probably going to die, you'd have to just deal with it directly because you maybe only have a few days to deal with it and it's going to happen probably. So you just have to kind of set yourself up for this kind of cutthroat reality check. But because we live in a culture with all these screens and all this content that's being generated by people who want your attention, we always have a way to opt out of the reality check. Because we don't want reality. Because <laughs> reality is too painful, right? It's the loop. The loop just loops. It loops and loops and loops. So at a certain point, you have to say, why do I care about the reaction I have to the phenomenon more than I care about the relationship with the phenomenon itself? Why can't I just be here with the completely and total uncomfortability of what I'm feeling without doing anything about it? Because some of you you're addicted to a pattern of self-harm. So there's two ways we can get our narcissistic hits. One is we can outsource, we can shoot our energy outward at other beings. And the other is we can insource, or we can turn the gun on ourselves. Um, and both of those give us a kind of I'm I'm such a poor victim, I have to do this kind of idea. And that's very, that produces a kind of opioid in the system. And if you get really somatically clear about what's happening, when you entertain certain stories or reactions, you can actually feel these opioids and endorphins generate in the body. And you can go, oh... When I engage in this pattern of coping that I have learned to do, it releases a kind of chemical that makes me feel good in a certain kind of nasty way, just like a just like heroin or crack or whatever you want to call it, coffee, alcohol. And that's what I'm addicted to. So it's imagine if you were addicted to a substance and I gave you another substance to clear yourself of that substance, you became addicted to that substance as well. And then I had to give you another substance to deal with the addiction from the second substance. And then the third and fourth and fifth. That's actually what we're dealing with in our system. Is this cascade of replacement addictions that all together combine into a web inside of our system that produces a kind of adrenalinic, endorphinogic fucking soup, a cocktail of drugs in the system that somehow we've learned to integrate in this kind of way, like fake food. And so we're getting nourishment from our own fear cycle or our own fight or flight cycle. And 
this is a very difficult thing to talk about because one hand it's not really conscious and on the other hand it is conscious we are doing it because of how we interact with reality and there's no fucking good answer here for people who want to get i just want to be have relief and feel comfortable and safe and there's no i can't give you any of that because that doesn't fucking exist all we can do is go yeah i feel this way yeah yeah if i think about it in a certain way i hate it and then that makes me feel other ways instead of oh shit I feel this way. I'm not going to put any spices on this. No seasoning. Oh, now I have a reaction to how bland and boring and how angry I am about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's still seasoning. The anger is seasoning on top of something else. Oh, no. That means, okay, so anger is hiding grief. This is bullshit. This is total bullshit. Grief is just another fucking spice packet you put on it. What happens when you keep putting all these emotional narratives on top of the actual thing? You lose track of it forever, maybe, until you're dead. Until you see it clearly like a flash of lightning because you're so sick of your own fucking jokes. And you'll get caught in a bunch of lies because these somatic practitioners and therapists have the best process for you to heal and really what they mean is get back on the course of capitalism so you can pay your rent which might actually be fine and all i'm saying is the reason that we're so fucked up is because hardly anybody is sober and until even a few of us get more sober it's not going to get any better at all because it has to get worse sometimes if anyone has ever detoxed from a hard drug like you know anything crack cocaine alcohol heroin whatever meth there's a period in the detox process that feels worse than the actual addiction this is also similar for certain diseases like goo syndrome which i have it's a kind of ancestral, psychic, biological curse syndrome based in microorganisms and karma. It causes a kind of poor gut, gut brain kind of connection. It causes like all these autoimmune issues and weird symptoms and nerve ganglia issues, HPA axis issues. All of these are, you know, if you, if you know, you know, these kind of mast cell disorders. If you're really interested in healing this thing that goes beyond just your psychology and into your physiology, and you find a doctor and a process that allows you to actually work towards death in a way that's a little bit more sober than you were before, not just binging on the fucking bread because that's what the microorganisms want you to do, not just outsourcing your pain because that's what the ghosts want you to do and the ancestors who are traumatized need you to kill another whole fucking group of people because you are oh you've been traumatized so you've got to stop all the other people from possibly traumatizing you so we just need another scapegoat right this kind of thing that's happening right now in the middle east people who have been scapegoats creating new scapegoats to target if you don't want to do that then you will have a period of time that might last years or decades. You might actually kill you, and you have to be accepting of that. That the cure might hurt worse than the disease. The detox might hurt worse than the addiction itself. And... I want to tell you this because on this path, only sober people with clarity will tell you this kind of shit. 
because they'll be like, I'm going through it too, buddy. Just hold on, breathe, go for a walk, take a lot of baths, try to breathe, try to sing, try to dance, try to write, try to make art, try to get through it without going back to the drug that's inside your own heart. Making up a new story about how nobody loves you, that's the drug. Making up a new story about how you're persecuted by the bad guys, that's a drug. Making up a new story about how you're a victim and you have to do something about it, that's a drug. Making up a new story, a new story, a new reason, a new story, a new trauma story, a new story about a story about a story about a story. And maybe you can get to the point where you can use stories to kill stories. And that's sort of the edge that I'm going to leave us on today, because these kinds of sermons on the mount bullshit that I try to do in my sick ass state to try to get people just fucking clear with the basics. It's not really the thing itself. It's like a preamble. It's like the instruction manual on how to use your chainsaw. You should read the instruction manual on how to use your fucking chainsaw. But it's not... Reading the instruction manual is not actually using the chainsaw safely or productively. You know what I'm saying? So we're still at the point in the society where we're like, here's the user manual for your fucking nervous system. Try to strip away as much bullshit, colonial, doctrine, manifest destiny, Christianity, Catholicism, bullshit out of it. And then we could maybe do the thing that it's designed to do to get through the pain, fear, and hunger that it experiences. And when I say get through, I mean, I don't mean cure it. I mean fucking work it. Like, hey, buddy, you're here all the time. Pain, fear, and hunger all the time. I need to get right with you. Which is to say, you're not going anywhere. So I need to get right with you. I need to get good with you. I'd have a good relationship with you because you show me where I'm still a fucking addict. You are wisdom. You are wisdom itself and I need to respect and honor you as wisdom. And how do I do that? Well, maybe once I have the right view, I can have some methods that might actually get me in right relationship. But that does not mean cure. That does not mean solve. At a certain level, it just means play. Let's sing a song together. Let's do a dance. Let's uh, go for a walk and see if we can see things from a different perspective. Maybe we write a story about this, and then we burn the story. And then we write another story, and then we burn that story too. Because it's in the act of doing these creative relational tendings that we can actually go, Oh, wow, I'm not really who I think I am, and my fucking ideas are so flimsy, but they give me something while I'm working with them. But then I get addicted to them. And so I have to get rid of them too. So it's this constant churning. Might make you sick, might make you nauseous, might make you feel crazy. But remember, all of that sick, nauseous, crazy, probably your addictive defense mechanism trying to make you go back to the drug. Because the drug is simply dualism, colonialism, imperialism and all of its downstream nonsense, patriarchy, hierarchy, all of this hoarding shit, I'm owed something. I deserve something. 
all of this story that we tell ourselves, I'm a good person, I'm an empathetic person, I'm a smart person, I'm a kind person, all of this, drugs, 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 drugs. So if you can understand that those stories are drugs, you might actually be able to have a chance to play with those stories and then destroy them through stories. And for me, as a theater maker, I think that's a useful, uh, a useful waste of my time while I'm still alive for some ungodly unknown reason. Because I'm supposed to be dead. Somehow I've been granted this very weird half-life where I'm sick as fuck and disabled and then I have this weird wisdom gift that I've been given and it also makes me skeptical and suspicious as hell because hardly any of your favorite people are talking about this because they're talking to placate the masses on some more dope. And I'm tired of this bullshit. I'm tired of watching everyone get high while they say that they're getting clear. It's happening everywhere in every subsector because people are so fucking freaked out that they need a new drug to mask the problems of the old one. Right? Because this, again, this house of cards that we have built, there's a hurricane coming. Because that's the natural order of things. Things get built up, and then they get broken down. And then they get built up, and then they get broken down. And if you're a good, right relationship kind of person, you will plan for these floods, these hurricanes. You will actually tend the world in such a way that you could live in harmony with it, in these ebbs and flows. But for the last few hundred years, maybe even a few thousand, we have not done this. And it's time to collect. <laughs> so as we're all falling down, we're going to start killing each other more. Imperialism is going to kill more of us as it dies from its own hubris. I want you to understand this very clearly. This is a very small moment in history where we have the capacity over the internet to talk to each other in this way. It's not going to last forever. I grew up before it was possible, and I'm going to probably see the end of it. And what that means is you need to use it for what it's good for and prepare for when it's gone. Because when it's gone and you are not the sanity keeper, you don't have the right view, that's a shit, you're shit out of luck. You're going to take the view of whatever greasy car salesman waddles into your post-apocalyptic trailer park. Because you're just so fucking bored and so addicted and you want novelty and salvation. So that's what's going to happen. And that's what's going to happen for a lot of people because it's happening now. That's what 90% of the economy is based on. is selling people things they don't need because they're afraid. And this is mostly because of white people and what white people have done to themselves and others. And... I'm in the process of re revamping my business and it might it might never work and it might, might shut it down because I can't deal with this anymore on a certain level. I can't deal with how fucked up white people are and they're they're just so remedial on a certain level. And uh they fight the work in such a way that is just disturbing. But I think what I would say is you know, for all people who have white ancestry, you have to kill your whiteness, 100%. You have to kill all your white ancestors. You have to kill all the ideas about whiteness. You have to understand you're not white. If you could understand that you aren't white, 
and go beyond your tribalism stupidity, you might have a shot of being a human being. A shot. It's not guaranteed, because we're all fucking in the soup, you know? But I think the biggest thing you have to realize is that this idea has corrupted your ability to perceive reality. It corrupted mine for a very long time, too. I was indoctrinated as a child, even though part of me was fighting back all the time. It's a brainwashing methodology. And if you can't see that it's a brainwashing methodology, you won't fight against it and deal with the weird after effects of your Stockholm Syndrome about it. You'll actually think you need to be the certain way that white people want you to be in order for them to hear the truth. Which is how we get the greasy car salesman shit that's happening. Because white people have the money and the power. And in order to pay your rent, you have to placate them. And you have to write books for them. And you have to talk for them. Because they can make or break you. In your popularity, your status, your finances. And we're dealing with this a thousand percent of the time. And if you start looking at your heroes through this lens, you might see that they're not so fucking heroic. And they'll have reasons why they do it. Very good rational reasons to get you back on the teat. So you have to be very, very cautious about who you get your fucking information from. And why you want that information in the first place. You have to go through the very painful detachment process of recognizing that a lot of people you enjoyed at a certain part of your development, you get better, you get clearer, you get more sober, and you realize, nah man, that ain't it. And if you've watched my journey through the past five years that I've put publicly out, you'll see me that I've done this. That it's been done for me because I've aligned myself with wisdom nature, which means that if the hurricane comes, I don't fight it. I just have to accept it. And if that means I lose, in quotes, more people and more friends and more opportunities, I say, bring it on, Huracan. Bring it on. Destroy for me what is not true. You have to understand that in the old way, these forces of nature that are gods, they come to do the thing that you are too afraid to do, that you are too stupid to not recognize that you have to do. So eventually, when it happens, you align yourself and go, may I be like you? to do what must be done in the name of all our relations. And this might mean sometimes you are a killer, a killer of addiction and ideas and identities and fictions, and you will not be liked. They will not rush to your fucking aid when you are in trouble. You have to understand what it means to really be animist in the way that I'm talking about. It is not about getting what you want. It is not about getting richer and more wealthy, have more power. That's a very white affide way of looking at this stuff. It's okay to pray for money. But if you don't understand why you're, you want money and why you want power, if it's not to help people get sober, you're going to court some really fucking weird, weird shit in your life, in your karma. So just recognize the things I'm saying, you're not going to find a lot of people who agree with it. It's too fucked up for a lot of people. It seems like nihilism and defeatism and futility. And I'm saying on some level it is to the white mind, to the dualistic mind, 
to the materialistic mind, to the colonized mind, it is nihilism. But to the animistic mind, to the non-dual mind, is not nihilism. Because nihilism is also a story you tell yourself to dope yourself up from having responsibility and being real with the world. Nihilism is a fucking great escape. I'm not talking about escape routes anymore. I'm not talking about what you need to do to soothe your goddamn fucking nervous system. Because your nervous system is the earth. So if the earth is fucked up, guess what, honey? You're going to be fucked up too. What you think is going on, you think the oceans being the way that they are is somehow not your bodily fluids? You think kids in the Congo is not you? You think somehow you can be distant from what's happening on this planet? That's not how it works. So until we have a better story, until we have a better story that actually is accurate to reality, and until you are rooted in that story and you can't be conned out of it, which is going to take a long fucking time, I'm still working on it for myself, you got to be real careful. Because anything that feels like the thing that you're missing so you can be a better person, oh my god, you will fucking do some nasty shit to get it. And I've seen it over and over with the white clients that come and the people circling my field all day long. You want your cake and eat it too. That's what you want. You want to have your cake and eat it too. It's a very addicted, normalized pattern. I want to have everything I still have and more. I want to have the life I already have, the house I already have. I want my kids to love me. I want my partner to be the right partner for me. I want to not lose my job. I want to keep it and actually be have more of it. I want more money and I want more sobriety too. And I want more power too. And I want more understanding too. I need to fucking tell you because I know some of you are watching this now or will watch it in the future. I see your stupidity. This is not a path of more. Wisdom is not a path of and, 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 that too, gimme, gimme, materialism. That's not it. It's a sacrificial path, and that does not mean martyrdom. It just means to make sacred, sometimes you lose. You give up something. You give up opportunity, status money, love, cuddle parties, drugs. You give up something in order to sacralize the process of continuing wisdom and seven generations being blessed. You give up something. You don't get more of it. So you have to recognize that this path I'm talking about, it's not nihilistic, it's not defeatist, it's not like a masochistic path. And yet, you will become so in a dance with pain, fear, and hunger that you will start to get a feeling of love where you go, as long as I'm in a correct relationship with these forces, I am so willing to give up what I need to give up in order to make this even more sacred and even more in alignment and even more dynamic and creative and loving and, and kind and real. And it is not about creating more fantasies. We only tell that to beginners because they're so kind of remedial 
that they won't do this without a reward. So we tell them, imagine the consort floating above your head and the 10,000 Buddhas are beaming non-dual light energy into their sexual union and they are filtering it and drops of nectar fill your skull and drip down through your central channel. And as that's happening, this clear light ambrosia pushes out this toxic, black, grimy, filthy karma out of your system. And it, you can see it and feel it draining through the soles of your feet and out your orifices all the way down. And as it goes down, to, down through the earth, you see the god of death with a, a mouth, 10,000 hungry mouths open wide eating your filth because that's what they need to turn it into the next best thing for something else to happen. You see how that's a visualization? That's a sort of normal visualization in Buddhism, right? And that feels good for a second. So you have to do it until you get over it. And you better get over it fast is what I'm telling you. Because this kind of, you need all that to feel better kind of shit. It's just a trick. But the reason that's a trick is because there really are those beings existing in the universe going, hey, buddy, you could just plug your ass in and do this little fucking thing and get right for five minutes. Until you go, why do I unplug? Why do I fucking unplug? Why do I forget that that's just happening all the time? Why do I have to turn it on? And that's the that's the kind of path I'm talking about here is like you you lose your illusions about turning it on and off. The story that you tell yourself about um, how things really are. And you realize you're just a kind of delusional drunk in a dream world. And you, you're the cause of most of your fucking issues because you don't want to die. But if you're already fucking dead anyway, because time isn't what you think it is, if you can destroy all of your excuses logically one by one through logic and creativity, then maybe you have a chance of being sober in this lifetime for just a second so that when you die, you're like, no big deal, buddies. Don't remember me. I don't want to be remembered. Just let me go. Because isn't that what you want to give other people to? I want let, I want to let you go too. I want you to be able to experience something so fresh and not stagnant and so dynamic and so multifaceted and complex and transformative that in order for you to have that, I would have to let go of you. I have to lose you. I have to give us something up. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is how it all ties together from birth to death and all these little deaths in between sleeping, breathing, eating, shitting, getting sick. Look. I hope that you take this to heart and really fucking digest it and really check yourself and ask yourself what the fuck you're actually doing. Like, do you actually have a fucking practice? Does it actually have a right view? Or are you still just a fucking gobbledygook, deluded fool who's constantly looking for super mommy or super daddy to help them be like some fucking superhero? Or can you get rid of all that shit and just do the goddamn practice? And just show up exactly as you are, but not exactly as your addictions want you to be. But actually, as you actually are. Can you be a singing and dancing being? Can you just go, man, this is a crazy dream and it hurts a lot. 
it hurts a lot. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to be with that. It hurts a lot, but I don't need to make it bad. And it's going to be really hard to do that when everyone around you is saying, no, hurting is wrong. It's bad. We need to stop it. And on some level, they're correct. We shouldn't be doing what we're doing. But on another level, we have to use it correctly. Because your pain is a resource. So don't waste it. And I see a lot of people just wasting their pain. And that's wisdom. You're wasting your wisdom. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. I hope this did something for you in a good way for the good of all your relations. And I hope you take it out into the world and actually get clean, get sober, and actually be able to meet somewhere where you can actually like get to the real work. Because what I'm talking about here is still not the real thing. This is just the instruction manual for the chainsaw.